You're listening to the Faith and Other Oddities podcast, brought to you by the Raven Creek Social Club, where we talk about faith and other oddities. For questions, comments, or to be part of the conversation, join us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, where you can find us at Raven Creek SC. Now for your hosts, Emily Dixon and Nathan Underwood. Well, hey everyone, welcome back to Faith and Other Oddities. It's good to be back here. We're wrapping up the weekend. Yeah. So we had lunch. I don't know if that was wise. I don't know. Yeah, we'll see how this goes. <laughs> but uh, something I wanted to do real quick, just kind of a, uh, in the way of announcements and quick housekeeping thing. Um, we were actually uh, recently uh, asked to join the Fringe Radio Network. Johnny mm-hmm. emailed us. And when I first saw it, I thought it was some kind of like forum email. And, but he had some very specific observations about the show. So he likes the Raven. Yeah, he said he likes the Raven and asked if, <laughs> asked if he if we wanted to to join up over there. So um, to all the listeners over on the Fringe Radio Network, hey, thanks for tuning in. Mm-hmm. I hope you're enjoying it so far. And uh, be sure to check out our backlog too, which is also on a uh, Apple Podcast. And there's over a hundred episodes there, so feel Crazy. free to check them out. <laughs> Crazy, we've been doing this so long. Yeah, that long. <laughs> yeah. So. Um, yeah, I don't want to like I, said, I don't want to take a, a whole bunch of time on that, but I did uh, want to give a shout out to Johnny and Fringe Radio and and say thanks for having us on. We're yeah. we're glad to be part of it. Yeah, I I've been looking at some of the lineup, and I, I'm going to check out some new podcasts I hadn't listened to before. It, uh, you know, always need a new podcast. Oh yeah, yeah. Well, I <laughs> yeah, well, I, I've mentioned before. I I work eight hours. No, I work ten hour days um, as a janitor, and so I've got plenty of time by myself where I'm. Uh, <laughs> Just get to listen to podcasts, so I'm always running out of good material. So <laughs> I'm glad to, to glad to find another place. Just trying to make me jealous. <laughs> yeah. Well, you get you get more time to read. Yeah, yeah, with earbuds in to block out the husband. But anyway, <laughs> a little too much family together this this year. I think a lot of us have been feeling that. So yeah, we we've had a yeah we had a lot of downtime here, but we're we're kind of back to it. So. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, hopefully but, things will keep trucking and we can all kind of get back to normal. Yeah. So. Well, cool. Well, let's get back to doing our Bible thing and. Yeah. So see we're where we wind up. We're in Samuel thirty still. Um, we left off last week. David had found the Egyptian uh, slave who had been cast aside by the Amalekites, mm-hmm. and uh, we talked about how weird it was that he would pause in you know this rescue mission to take care of a slave that didn't even belong to him. And also the fact that this is a guy who participated in the raid. Mm -hmm. He, he wasn't just a bystander. I mean, he actually says we raided, we did this, we did that. He definitely includes himself in the events and the things that the Amalekites were doing. And so you've got that wonderful contrast between David and Saul, because the last time we had the Amalekite king compared to the king of Israel, Saul didn't come out looking so well. And this time, we're seeing a completely different side of David as he's being contrasted with the Amalekites here. Right. So uh, we're going to pick up in verse 15. It says, And David said to him, Will you take me down to this band, referring to the Amalekites? And he said, Swear to me by uh, by God that you will not kill me or deliver me into the hands of my master, and I will take you down to this this band. So the the slave is saying, Yeah, just as long as you don't, Give me back to the people who mistreated me. Uh, I'll help you out. I don't have a problem with that. Now, this request is like massively bold because at this time, a slave is legal property of another person. Right. So you you would return them as almost a matter of civic duty. You you would not hang on to them, or if you did hang on to them, you you would make them your own slave. Mm -hmm. And so you know this the fact that this guy should expect to either be returned or kept as a slave by someone within David's group, it is, it's kind of odd that he even thinks he has a right to make a request. And the fact that he participated, like I said, in the destruction of Ziklag. But on the other side of things, this is the thing I don't think most of us recognize, he is asking that David honor the Torah. Right. Because if you go to Deuteronomy 23, 15 and 16, It says, you shall not give up to his master a slave who's escaped from his master to you. He shall dwell with you in your midst, in the place he shall choose within your towns, wherever it suits him. You shall not wrong him. 
So I, I know that it's very popular to talk about, oh, well, the Bible condones slavery, and how could you follow a book that, that condones slavery? Okay, there are issues with slavery, and we've talked about that some, but here, look at this flip side. This command in Deuteronomy is crazy because you don't just let an escaped slave come into your town, pick out whatever place he wants to live, and make his home there. Right, right. Well, and also you look at, if you look at the the system that was there, it was more of a financial, uh, kind of an indentured mm-hmm. servitude, mm-hmm. typically with the Israelites. It wasn't like what we think of with, uh, you know, the, the American slave trade, right. which was just awful. I mean, it, yes. there's, there's no excusing it. Mm-hmm. And, but the way that a lot of this, the slavery happened, now it probably wasn't with the Amalekites, Mm -hmm. Um, so much, but with Israelites, it was the, if you got into too much debt, you would go and you would work for the person, either the per, either someone would buy your debt out Mm -hmm. and you would go and work that off, or you would go work off the debt to the person you owed. Right. And, but with that were certain responsibilities in certain ways you were expected to treat this person. So if this person's escaping, it means you are a bad master. Exactly. It means you're not doing your part Mm -hmm. of the bargain. So, and. The idea was not to just have a slave. It was, it was a way to let this person continue to provide for their family and themselves mm-hmm. when they had accrued too much debt and give them a way of escape. And it's interesting that even in that provision, there, there is the option for the slave to become a part of a household and to mm-hmm. stay with mm-hmm. that household. So this tells you that it's got to be a pretty good system that's set up. And the fact that you, you know, if someone does run away, you don't return them. To, uh, like you said, that person was being a bad master. They were violating the agreement. They were violating standards of practices. But I, it just, it's mind blowing to me because not only is it providing a way out for the slave, it's actually endangering whoever lets that runaway slave stay with them. Mm-hmm. So you aren't just saying, hey, you, know, you get to stay with us. You're saying, we're going to defend you. We're going to put our own lives at risk so that you have a place to set, to stay, mm-hmm. because the angry master shows up. I mean, when you look at people like David, you know he's got three, I mean, six hundred men with him, and if you owned a a piece of land that you were ranching, you know, with lambs and goats and what have you and sheep, you've got other men who would come to to fight alongside of you to reclaim this slave. So it wasn't. A no risk situation right. for whoever housed this runaway slave. Now, this wasn't. I mean, obviously the Amalekites in this case they don't care. You know where this guy is. They kicked him out. They thought he was going to die. Mm-hmm. But that doesn't mean that you know if if things had just carried on and there wasn't this conflict, this this fight between them later, it doesn't mean that the Amalekite master couldn't at some point go, hey, oh yeah, I want him back. Because I did pay for him. I, I don't care if you nursed him back to health. Right. Health, he's mine. Right. And as an Amalekite, he's not going to care what the Torah says. Yeah, exactly. And, and I just, I love that, that built-in protection for people who are being wronged. Mm-hmm. And, mm-hmm. and we see this over and over again in the Torah. There is a system of protection within it. And it's not like, you know, the Ten Commandments. It's not the easily accessible. It's the, it's the verses that nobody wants to read because they're dry, they're boring, mm-hmm. and so they mm-hmm. don't read them, and they go, well, I saw this verse, verse over here. This must be the only thing it has to say about this matter, and it's terrible. You know? Right. It's- it, well, and it, the, the other thing about taking someone into your house as this indentured servant or, the, or, this, or in the, the slavery, you would have part of your job was to teach them how to manage household affairs. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. it was basically a way of helping them get back on their feet if yes. you were a good master. Yes. If you, if you did the right thing. Mm-hmm. But it wasn't just like, oh, I own you, so I'm going to exploit you. Right. It was, hey, I'm going to give you I'm going to give you an out from your debt so you're not just destitute the rest of your life. Exactly. Exactly. And it really provided that sense of we are responsible for each other mm-hmm. and, and we need to be taking care of each other and doing so in very tangible ways and not just letting it go through some kind of bureaucratic system, but people actually making personal investments into each other's lives. Right. And I, it's it's a beautiful system when you really think about it 
how it would look if it was properly implemented. Have we ever properly hu- implemented it as humanity? Probably, Probably not. not. Yeah. <laughs> but the, the potential's there. Now, not only does the slave have a claim on David's generosity because you know he is a runaway slave and protected under Torah, he also has a claim because he's an Egyptian. And this is another fascinating thing. So Deuteronomy 23.7 cites that you know Israel spent their time in Egypt. And the reason... Um, the reason that they were there was protection and that they're supposed to be protected. They were offered protection by the Egyptians during this time. So right. now whenever an Egyptian needs refuge or they need to want to come live with in the land of Israel, the Israelites are supposed to offer the same kind of hospitality that the Egyptians had shown them, which is again, crazy because the group of people who received the Torah, who got these commands, were the ones who'd been enslaved. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It, it wasn't a, hey, let me uh, have you over for a house guest. It was them being there serving Pharaoh and building these grain, you know, the, these grain storage facilities. And the fact that this is the law that God gave them, I think this is another sign that it is a God-given law. And it's not just something that the people of Israel developed while they left Egypt and were on their way to Canaan, because what slave says, oh, I need to remember my master's hospitality of letting me stay at his house and doing all the work. And so it's, it's, I don't know, it just, there's so many things that we have not been told about the Torah that until you actually get into it, you don't understand are there and you don't see the grace and mercy that God has, has just incorporated throughout Mm -hmm. these laws. So verse 16, and then he had taken him down, and this is the slave taking um, David down. Behold, they were spread out abroad all over the land, eating and drinking and dancing because all the great spoil they had taken from the land of the Philistines and Judah. So, you know, they're feeling good. They've made a good, Mm -hmm. clean getaway. They they are enjoying the food. They're, They're feasting. They're throwing a party. They're probably relying on the fact that the Philistines and Judah are fighting each other. And I very much have this image of, you know, the jackals are fighting over the kill and the the vulture who sneaks in and and grabs the the meat that's being unguarded, Uh kind of. Yeah. That's that's how I kind of see them in this moment. It's like, oh, yeah, they, they were too busy with each other. So we could take whatever we want. Right. And and they, I mean, they didn't even get that far away, evidently before they decide, hey, let, let's have a party. So verse 17, David struck them down from twilight until evening of the next day, and not one man among them escaped, except 400 young men who mounted camels and fled. Now, we got a little linguistic problem here, because the word twilight can also mean morning. So it, it's that time when the sun's in... The it's, time between times. The time between times, Yeah. <laughs> And so there's some debate on where... It could be dawn or twilight, is what you're saying. Yeah, yeah, pretty much. Yeah, so we're trying to figure out, did they fight all night long and uh, to the next sunset? Or did they fight from sometime that morning till sunset? And you know, these are the kinds of things academics spend a lot of time trying to figure out when the truth is it really doesn't matter. The main thing is they, they attacked when it was dark. Mm-hmm. That's, that's the point that the writer is trying to make. And the reason why they're trying to make this point is because back in Genesis 14, we have similar features. And this is a uh, story we talked about it on one of our podcasts before, but it's the, the Battle of the Four Kings when the rulers of Sodom and Gomorrah had left and their, <laughs> they had left their city unprotected. Mm-hmm. Man, that lunch. It was good, but it's making me sleepy. And so... Well, it's Thanksgiving food. It was leftover turkey and ham, so... Yeah, it was really good. But when they left their city unprotected, um, the the inhabitants of those cities were, were taken hostage. And so Abraham had actually went and pursued the captors, and he'd gone with a similar, similarly sized force of men. I think he had a little over 300. Right. And... He rescues uh, his family and the other families, in particular Lot. But then he will divide the spoils of war among the men who fought with him. And it was at this point that Melchizedek appears. 
And so you remember back to that point in time when Melchizedek, uh, he blesses Abraham and he promises that God has given Abraham this land of Israel, that it's Hmm. going to belong to him. And so you were being reminded of this, this time when, um, when the promise was originally made. And so we've got the, the, connection not only do we have a first mention of the amalekites but we also have that attack at night to return hostages from cities that had been plundered right so the 400 young men escaping on camels now this is this is really really kind of interesting as far as number one we know that the amalekites did use camels they this was part of their quick getaways from these little lightning raids that they would make okay um but this this battle overall proves to be a de- a decisive battle for David and his men. Basically, after this, the Amalekites disappear. Uh, we see them. Uh, we see an individual. He'll be showing up in Second Samuel. That's going to be one of the last times we see an individual. But we never see another sizable force in the reign of David. I mean, they they just of the Amalekites of the Amalekites. Yeah, they're they just they're gone. And they don't reappear until First Chronicles. And that's First Chronicles 443, and it's during the reign of Hezekiah. And we're told that, and they, which are the, the men from the tribe of Simon, defeated a remnant of the Amalekites who had escaped, and they live there to this day. So the men of Simon live there to this day, not the Amalekites. Mm-hmm. Now, David reigned somewhere around 1000 BCE. Hezekiah reigned somewhere between 680 to 715 BCE, but we're not really sure. But, you know, so there's roughly 300 years between okay. the escape of this event in 1 Samuel 30 and the events of 1 Chronicles 4. So we, we aren't certain that we're talking about the same escape, Okay. but there's no other situation in which Amalekites escape. So we really don't know what other time it could be, unless there's just an event that the Bible doesn't record, and well, which is possible. Yeah, and, and but after that point, when the remnant, when these escapees are killed, then we aren't we're never told anything about the Amalekites, and you know it's it seems like it's over, and this becomes a really interesting part of of Jewish theology because. Even though Amalek or the Amalekites don't appear anywhere again in the story, their continued existence is a major theological point. And so the idea that even though he's been wiped out as a nation or the uh, the Amalekites have been wiped out as a nation, that Amalek still exists. Okay. And he exists within the individual. So anytime we're tempted to take advantage of the neglect or abuse someone who's weak or, you know, fail to protect the defenseless, it, you know, anytime we act with cruelty or hubris, then we are required to rise up and fight against Amalek within us. Mm-hmm. And so that we would seek to destroy the Amalek that tries to to bring out the worst in us. And so therefore the 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 battle of Amalek never ends. It, it's an ongoing battle for all of humanity, in particular for the Jews, as the eternal enemies of Amalek. Because okay. you know, we go Kinda back. Makes sense. Yeah, it, it's really it, very sophisticated, and you can look up uh, articles on this where the rabbis kind of work through it, and it, it's it's very interesting that you know we we talk about oh well, the devil made us do it <laughs> as Christians, uh, we'll say things like that. But in Jewish theology, it's not so much the devil made you do it; it's no, it's it's that remnant of a melech that that lives within humanity. So mm. I thought that was very interesting that they would kind of operate. Um, occupy similar situations in the theological uh, mind frame, whatever, in what landscape, however we want to... Worldview. Yeah, there we go. So now I did get to speak with somebody this week who was asking about what happened to Amalek. Uh, yeah, there, there's a lot of speculation on these various tribes um, that we can trace back to the Rephaim and the Nephilim and, and what happened to those bloodlines. So when we say that they were wiped out or they went away, does this mean that no individuals could survive? I have a hard time 
definitively saying absolutely not. When the Bible says all were destroyed, then all were destroyed. Because so often in the Bible, all doesn't always mean all as mm -hmm. we think of it. Right. Now, before anyone turns us off, just, just keep listening. <laughs> because if you go back to 1 Samuel 15, 9, we're told that Saul devoted all the Amalekites to destruction at the edge of the a sword. Right. With the exception of King Agag, who later gets killed. So according to 1 Samuel 15, 9, that should have been all the Amalekites. It should have been done. Right. Now, why are they back in chapter 30? It's because all in that situation meant everyone in that area, all the Malachites that Saul faced, it didn't include all the Amalekites who yeah. existed. And so sometimes whenever the Bible says all, what it means is all the people or all the things in that particular location or to the knowledge of the writer or to the knowledge of the, the participants in that activity. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean always globally or you know, dealing with something that's going on in China. It, it's talking about their world as they know it and as they know it in that moment that the story is being told. Right. So it, it's not saying that the Bible's lying to us. I'm saying we have to see it from their perspective. And sometimes you know, you've got kids, you need to go pick up all the Legos. Your definition of all the Legos is not the same definition of your child many times. Mm -hmm. You know, you want the Legos under the bed and you want the Legos in the hallway and they've got the ones in the middle of the floor. What, so that should be good enough. It's kind of the same idea. And now the literal existence or continuation of these bloodlines has been there's been a lot of debate about that and whether it could even be possible. Um, and I, I wanted to address it, uh, address it because it does pose a problem because there is the command within the Torah that once you get settled in the land of Israel, you're supposed to wipe out Amalek from all the earth. Right. So the idea that you need, you, you have a religious obligation to kill everyone from this bloodline is part of Judaism. Sure. And there's no getting around it. So the, ra the rabbis, however, I say there's no getting around it. Uh, the rabbi has found a nice... There's not an obvious way, right? <laughs> right. That's really how we should say it. Well, yeah, because the rabbis are always going to figure out something. Uh, that this is what they're good at. They're really good <laughs> at, at trying to come up with some, some great solutions. So one solution that they came up with is that... Um, after the exile, that the bloodlines had been so intermingled that essentially you didn't know who was a Melech and who wasn't. So you could accidentally kill an Israelite who was a Melech, or you could let somebody live who should have been killed. Mm -hmm. And because you couldn't tell the difference and you risk incurring blood guilt for killing the wrong person, it was better just to refrain. Okay. So the, the, the law is suspended basically until God comes back to judge the nations. And then he, God, who knows everything perfectly, will know which person is a Melech and who isn't. Okay. The, the second solution is this law was only to be enacted once Israel had established a king. So if they don't have a rightful king, they can't carry out the law. So they had a king. A Melech was attacked. They don't have a king now. So it's got to be suspended until the Messiah comes and, and, and is enthroned. So once he becomes the king of Israel again, or is manifest as the king of Israel again. Okay. So to my knowledge now, nobody's been able to offer definitive proof whether or not the bloodlines of Amalek or any of the other tribes that are mentioned in or nations in uh, Deuteronomy 7 there mentioned whether they exist or don't exist. I mean, right. we just don't have the DNA uh, ability to go back and say, absolutely, this is, this is where they are, or this is where they, they aren't. And I, I don't want to lend credence to a lot of circumstantial evidence that is out there. I and mean, there's a lot of people who've come up with a lot of oh, well, this might prove that, that you could trace them back and it can be different um, physical characteristics. And I almost hate to mention them because there's a lot of people who've said, oh, well, this, this proves that this person had Nephilim blood. Right, and right. They're, they're using it to justify prejudice and bigotry and hate. And, and I wonder sometimes if it 
not sometime in the future, if it hasn't already, if it won't lend itself towards violence to right. certain human beings. Right. And it's definitely something we don't want to encourage. No, no. And, and, and there's no reason to, because number one, we're not the nation of Israel. Right. So it's not our job. Uh, and then also, I think... Wait, wait, wait. You mean that here in the 21st century, Christians are not supposed to set up a theocracy? Yeah, I think that's what I said. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I, it, it, it's... When we start thinking that we have to enforce God's law on the earth on other people, we just... We cause bitterness, we cause mm -hmm. hate, and we misrepresent God. Now, if we start living that law in our lives as an expression of love, mm -hmm. now we start to have an impact on the world we're living in. Right. So we, we need to be very careful about how we deal with each other, particularly people outside the church. And mm -hmm. I mm -hmm. cannot find an example of Jesus being mean to people outside the church. Uh, he corrected Pharisees. He jumped onto his own disciples, uh, you know. Oh, yeah. But as far as, you know, people who weren't a part of that established covenant or people who are having, you know, who are being excluded from it by the, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, those people he had great love and great empathy for. Mm -hmm. So, but a another answer that I think we have, too, is I think we need to keep reading. You know, a lot of times with the Bible, when you have a problem with something, the best thing to do is to keep reading because <laughs> there's going to be a solution. In this case, we would need to read all the way over to Ezekiel. And if you read Ezekiel 18, very famous passage. A lot of people are familiar with it. And it talks about how the proverb, you know, the father eats sour grapes and the son's mm -hmm. teeth are set yep. on edge. Well, the whole point in that section there is it's being revoked. Yeah. And you, yeah, no one's no one's allowed to blame their parents for where they are now. It, it, exactly. And it, later on in the chapter, this is verse 20, it says, The son whose sin shall die, the son shall not suffer for the iniquity of the father, nor the father for the iniquity of the son. The righteousness of the righteous shall be upon himself, and the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon himself. So God's saying, we aren't looking at bloodlines. We aren't looking at... at you know, links to specific clans or mm -hmm. certain people mm -hmm. groups. We're looking at how do you as an individual respond and are you honoring the law? Are you honoring God? Are you doing what's right in his eyes? Or are you just saying, well, I come from a bad family, so I've got to be a bad person. Right. And right. so I think that becomes our answer because now it is about the individual, not about the bloodline. And, and we'll see that, that, theme of personal responsibility continue into the New Testament. Mm -hmm. Well, and that that's uh, one of those things that you know, everyone, of course, wants to ask. Well, what about where it says he visits the the oh, what is it? Visit, visits the sin to the third and fourth generation, mm -hmm. and it's like, well, you you're not really looking at that in the context of the of the people who mm -hmm. were, who were around when it was written because. Number one, there was three and four generations typically alive at one time living and possibly in the, living in the same <laughs> house. Right. Um, so there's, there's that, that that's just the number of people that are alive mm -hmm. um, or number of generations that are mm -hmm. alive. The other, uh, another thing actually, and I think I heard this from Heiser, I could be wrong. So, um, but part of that is to say you're culpable for your, you know, you're, you're culpable regardless of who taught you, like mm -hmm. you said, that coming from a bad family. Yeah. Um, saying, well, this is just how I was raised, not an excuse anymore. Right. Is, is kind of another way of, of looking at that. And, and it, it is just sometimes a matter of, it, it's the simple answer is probably the right one. And, you know, even today, I can see how mistakes I made, well, they're affecting my kids, so they're affecting mm -hmm. my grandkids. And I mean, is that God, you know, visiting wrath out on my grandkids or something I did even before, you know, their my kids were born. No, that's just, that's cause and effect. That's consequence. Mm -hmm. And you need to be aware of that as a parent, as a, you know, people who hope to be parents, uh, your choices impact your children, your choices impact your grandchildren and your great grandchildren. And so we need to be careful. But the other thing too, and I think this gets missed and I really like this. I, you know, I heard it again, and I brought it, this podcast up uh, the last three episodes, I think, but the Lord of the Spirits podcast, but yeah. they're dealing with this, a lot of the same information. So 
um, I, I love what DeYoung had to say. He, he, he points out that in this point in time, they didn't know about DNA. Right. They, they didn't have this idea of genetic material being con you know, contributed to the following generations. But they did understand that families were who you aligned yourself with. Mm -hmm. So if you're, uh, he didn't quite put it that way, but I, to paraphrase him greatly and butcher it, but the idea, you are an Amalekite, not just because of any ancestral connection, it's the idea that, yes, you could have descended from them, but did you act like them? Did you live like them? And it mm -hmm. kind of goes back and it fits with that Jewish idea of Amalek. You fight the Amalek within you. Mm -hmm. He still exists because you, he, you, there are people who still want to act like him. Mm -hmm. And so how does a nation cease to exist when you stop doing the things that that nation did? So if there's nobody living and acting like a Malik, they don't exist anymore. That nation is gone. So the same thing for the Hittites, the same, you know, the same thing for any of the other nations that were supposed to be uh, wiped out. Because a lot of these nations that were in Canaan at the time of the conquest, they became a part of the nation of Israel. We see that with the Canaanites. I mean, Caleb, who was no way, shape, or form related to the Israelites, is, right. he, he is one. So much so that whenever I say Caleb wasn't an Israelite to just a random person from church, they're like, what are you talking about? Of course he was. Joshua right. and Caleb, one of the 12 <laughs> the, yeah. Uh, spies. Yeah. They're on the A-team, right? <laughs> exactly. I mean, he has to be an Israelite. Well, he was in the sense that he was loyal to Israel as a nation, mm -hmm. and he acted like the Israelites. So th this idea of, oh, well, do the bloodlines exist? The, the writers of the Bibles don't, don't even have that concept. They have the concept, do you act like the nation you're claiming to be? Right. And, and I really think that's great because when you come forward into the New Testament, well, how do you become a Christian? Do you have to be born into a Christian household? Or do you become part of the God's family by acting like God's one, by part, you know, acting like one of God's family by right. accepting that gift of salvation and by moving in repentance towards Him? You don't have to uh, be born into it. You can decide to become part of it because we get to choose how we're going to act, right? And we're going to get to choose who we're going to be loyal to. So, you know. I know for a lot of people that's like a really disappointing answer because they want they want to know can can we look at someone and tell by their eye color whether or not they would belong to some of these nations. I I don't know who has time for that. Evidently, a lot of people do. <laughs> I yeah, a, a lot. Well, of people. I, well yeah, I'm, sure, I'm sure my answer could be uh, my question could be answered with a simple Google search. Yeah, how many hits you're gonna get, which yeah. are gonna be hundreds of thousands of hits, and it, it's amazing to me. I, I think, you know, sometimes when the Bible is silent, we need to pay attention to, to the silence and go, okay, what's, what's being said here? And sometimes we need to look at the silence and go, okay, it's not telling us anything here. And there's probably a reason for that. And mm -hmm. it could be because it doesn't matter anymore. Or it could be that we don't need the information to hurt someone else with. Fair enough. Because I... I We've got enough reasons for people to act stupid and racist and ridiculous already, mm -hmm. and let's we don't need another thing thrown into the mix. Right. And so, yeah, I've, yeah, yeah, that's kind of where I, I land on that one. And say, yeah, I because me, you know, I'm still working on love the Lord your God with all your heart, <laughs> soul, and mind, and uh, doing that whole uh, love your neighbor as yourself thing. To be worried about hunting down Amalekites. Yeah. Yeah, uh, that should keep you pretty busy. Yeah, and that's it's a struggle. <laughs> yeah, especially when your neighbor's an idiot. Not that your neighbor's an idiot. I don't know your neighbor. You just moved. I had haven't got a chance. Our neighbor's really nice. <laughs> uh, yeah, I know you haven't. Yeah, you haven't met her yet. I don't so, think. No, I just don't want anyone to think I'm bad mouthing Nathan's neighbor. I'm no, speaking metaphorically. <laughs> she means neighbor in the sense of uh, you know. <laughs> Other people in general. Yeah, yeah. Not next door neighbor. <laughs> yeah, well, you, there's always somebody who's willing to pull something out of context. So, I mean... Yeah, make sure you cover it. Yeah. <laughs> so, moving on before I dig a bigger hole for myself. Verse 18. Dig up. <laughs> <laughs> David recovered all that the Amalekites had taken, and, and he, he 
rescues his two wives. And it says, nothing is missing. Verse 19, nothing was missing, whether small or great, sons or daughters, spoils or anything that had been taken from David or anything had been taken, David brought back all. So he's, he's brought back everything that was um, taken from Ziklag, which includes, the, you know, the people, the wives mm-hmm. and the children. But he's also taking everything back that the Amalekites had plundered from the Philistines, from the cities of Judah, and, you know, from the Canaanites. Right. So he's, um, the people are far more wealthy now than before they went on this recovery mission, this rescue mission. So verse 20 says, and also David also captured all the flocks and herds and the people drove the livestock before him and said, this is David's spoil. So the, the flocks and the herds were not part of the plundered stuff from the surrounding areas. This was the Amalekites' personal right. wealth. Right. And as the conquering warlord of this time, all that he captured in the battle belonged to him and everything that his people captured belonged to him as their leader. And so this is not harem. This is not that that devoted to destruction kind of ideology. Right. This is a rescue mission. This is a reclamation opera- operation. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so they're out trying to uh, reclaim what had been taken from them. So there's a reason why we're not killing everything taken from the Amalekites now, because if we're going to do that, now we're killing our wives and our children and the livestock that they had right. taken from us that we need to live. Yeah, and you know, I mean, that's just not a great mission to go on. It, yeah, yeah. At that point, you know, just just keep keep <laughs> actually you let them have them. Uh, but chapter, chapter, and also not a bad turnaround for a guy who was about to get stoned earlier in the chapter. Yeah, the spoil belongs to David. This is David's spoil. I mean, he he's being celebrated now, and and you can really see how this differs from chapter fifteen, where Saul, whenever he brought the um the animals back so he could give them to the people mm-hmm, and make mm-hmm. the people happy. And here's the people going in front of David and saying, this belongs to David. Look at us as we bring David's trophies back with us. And so one was Saul bowing to the will of the people, wrong mm-hmm. position for a king to be in. Yep. And here's the people elevating David and praising him. So you do see that great reversal. And the, you also see how with David, the, the structure, the hierarchy of authority remains intact, where with Saul, it was just all over the place. And often it was the other men in the courts leading the nation, not Saul himself, because Saul wasn't even present enough to, to be in charge of anything. Right. So verse 21, David, you know, he goes back to, to Bezor and the 200 men who had stayed behind, they were too exhausted. They come out to greet him. They, you know, they exchange their, their hellos. And in verse 22, this is a really interesting verse. It says, then all the wicked and worthless fellows among the men who had gone with David said, because they did not go with us, we will not give them any of the spoil that we have recovered, except each man may lead away his wife and his children and depart. So the the wicked and the worthless fellows. Now I know you're going to ask. So this is Blial. <laughs> it, it's not. How did you know? <laughs> right. It's not Ben Blial. It, it's not the um, sons of. It's just Blial. At this point, uh, the writer has just he's just shortened it. And again, we talked about those truncated phrases. Right. So now we we we've known throughout this whole book that sons of Blial means worthless. Now we'll just shorten it down to Blial. Okay. So it's also very interesting to note that where we had been so hard on the 200 who stay behind, you know, come on, guys, you got to go rescue your family. Why aren't you with David? They aren't classified as the wicked and worthless ones. It's the ones who yeah. went with David. Very and interesting. I thought that was a, an interesting flip. And so... The thing is, these guys who went with David who are saying this, they're following the custom of the day. The custom of the day is if you go and fight a battle and you go out and help with the war, then you get a portion of the spoils mm-hmm. and you know the king just gets to decide what those are. But if you don't fight, you don't get it. You, you have to have been an active participant in the, in the battle. And so you know, one question one might ask is if you're simply following the customs of the day, does that make you bleed all? But I'll let people think about that. Mm-hmm. So, you can sort that out on your own. Yeah. 
So the, the 200 men who, who stay behind, basically they had voluntarily given up any right to anything. And you notice in the previous verse, we're told that there's this greeting, this exchange of greetings, but they don't ask for anything. It, it's just immediately these guys jump forward and, and say, this is how we're going to do it. Mm -hmm. Like they expected there to be a request or they expected there to be some kind of, you know, share given to them mm -hmm. and they wanted to head it off at the pass. Nobody's saying this. They're the ones who come up with this idea at this point. But verse 23 David says, so you shall not do so, my brothers, with what the Lord has given us. He has preserved us and given into our hand the, the band that came against us. So David grasps reality, and this is one of his huge things that separates him between, uh, separates him from, from Saul. Saul. Yeah, that guy. And David understands that he didn't win this battle, that God won this battle. And one of the things that I... I learned recently from uh, DeYoung on the Lord of the Spirits podcast is part of the reason why you devoted everything to destruction and certain battles was to show that God fought it. You did not go out as a human being or a human army to say, I'm doing this to claim land or claim mm -hmm. riches mm -hmm. or to gain wealth. There's no reward in it for me personally. Right. So therefore I may be the, the instrument that fights, but God himself is the one who actually waged this war. This is the God who wins this war. And so therefore, all of it goes back to him. Okay, that makes sense. Uh, doesn't it though? So David, but David, even though he's not um, engaged in the Karam or that destruction or ban, he, he's saying God did win this war. Mm -hmm. And even whenever it's not the, the same kind of battle that you know, where, where you would devote to, things to destruction for God, he, all of his battles, he credits back to God. Right. You know, he, he, I don't know about all of them, but you know, the majority of them, especially at this point in time, I mean, you go back to Goliath, you know, God was the one who, who won that. Right. He was just being obedient and, and it's through obedience. He's allowed to participate and experience victory. And it's because God has won the battle that David doesn't have a right to hang on to what he's got. Mm -hmm. And so even though, yes, technically as the warlord, he could claim all this, he is saying that he's going to, to go ahead and treat it as if it's not his own because he is acknowledging God's not winning just the, the battles where there is a ban or the time to devote things to destruction. God wins all battles. And so I... I see this this change in David that not really a change, but kind of this this resurfacing of who he had been at the beginning of the book, and, and we're seeing him actually begin to sound like the the boy who killed a giant again. Right. And where before, I mean, he like we said, he, he looked at the exchange between David and Nabal, he sounded like Saul. Yeah. So this is reason why these stories are so important is we, we see that progression. And, you know, I really think one of the, the things I've noticed about people with faith that I admire, there are always people who, they, you know, they seem to have this really great faith, and then things got really crazy and murky for a while, and they got really real and working it out and confronting those questions. And, you know, they didn't always look like they were doing the right thing. They may have been looking like they were living in a Philistine city somewhere. Mm -hmm. and, and then when it, when it counted, when, it, when they really needed to step forward and make that decision, they came back mm -hmm. and they reclaimed that faith that had been under attack for so long. And, and those are the people that they make great leaders. They aren't just always the people who always had the great, the great testimony and the smooth life and everything seemed to go well for right. them. It's the people who had to fight these battles, their internal battles, even before they had to do the, the, the external battles. So David's asked the guys in verse 24, who would listen to you in this matter? You know, who cares what you have to say for as his share is who goes into battle shall his share be to those who stay by the baggage. They shall share alike. So David is directly addressing the situation at hand, but he hints at something that I think we all know. Saul was among the baggage. Mm -hmm. 
whenever Samuel went to anoint him for the second time, that's where he had been hiding. And, you know, and, and Saul had been in the baggage when he was anointed king. But David is the, the warrior king, the, the giant killer king. But David's saying it doesn't matter. We were both anointed king despite what we were or were not doing because God decides to dis, uh, bestow his favor on whoever he wishes. He's sovereign. This is what he gets to do. Mm-hmm. And we need to be okay with that. And I'm going to show you how being okay with that looks like even in this moment because here you go. We're going to divide the spoils uh, among everyone who is part of our camp. So verse 25, and he made it a statute and a rule, a statute and a rule for Israel from the day, from that day forward to this day. So this is not a one-time event. It isn't a one offer. It's, it's going to be a rule. And this is going to be the standard for a nation that served God and a God unlike any other God. And because Israel is a kingdom like any other king, uh, kingdom because they have a king who's not like other kings. Right. No other king at this time is going to just hand out money to everyone. Right. That makes no sense. Yeah. Um, I do have a question. Is this, a, is this a, a foreshadowing to Matthew 20, the parable of the, the wages? Yes. Okay. Yes. That's, that's what I figured when I was reading it. I'm like, I see this kind of a, a foreshadowing type of event where you got, you know, the guys who stayed behind, no, they didn't do the same work. Mm-hmm. But, you know, maybe it's important that they watch the package. I yeah. mean, it, so. It, 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 that's the thing. David really, he stands at this crossroads because we've got these moments in the past where Abraham did divide up the spoils with everybody who fought with him, but not with the people who stayed behind. Mm-hmm. But even that was, was kind of radical. And then Moses, whenever they fought against the Midianites, Moses um, divided, declared everything should be divided, but it's a one-time event. It, it's not an ongoing statute for right. the nation. Right. So when you've got David who's standing up and he's saying, hey, this is how it's going to be. Number one, this is the rule of a king to, to make a statute for a kingdom, but it's also the role of a prophet to be a lawgiver from God to, to say, this is how God's kingdom is going to operate, which is what Moses did. And it also is in keeping with Abraham, who was the, the founder of Judaism mm-hmm. and a prophet. And then you go, you go forward, and he, he is foreshadowing this, this time that Jesus is saying, there's going to be a different way our kingdom is going to operate. Mm-hmm. And so when he gives that parable, he's not saying, hey, here's something so completely new and radical that you aren't even going to recognize it. You should see this as something you're celebrated David did. Right, right. You should already be living this way. Why should you be living this way? Because David made it a rule for all of Israel back then and to this day. Mm-hmm. And so if you aren't living this way, you've missed the point. Because what David is doing, he, he's introducing a concept that is so mind-blowing that even today in our enlightened modern culture, we still can't get our minds around it. It's called equality. Right. You know, it really is. Because now it's not just the warrior who has a value in, in a social structure or an economy. The, the warrior isn't the one who gets to go out and actually bring in this vast amount of wealth and keep it all to himself. The warrior now has to share with the farmer who made sure the warrior got to eat. He has to share with the, art, uh, the artisan. The artisan. The artisan? Yeah. yeah that one. Yeah, that one. Uh, he has to share with the person who made his swords. He's, he's got to, to take into account that he doesn't f- function as an individual person who's capable, capable of doing these great things. He actually relies on a community of support right. that makes all of this possible. And these people are not expendable, and these people should not be neglected. They need to be valued just as much as he is valued. But, right. you know, these people also rely on his protection. So now everyone within the society has a chance to, to be considered important. Mm-hmm. And David's the one who introduces this to Israel. And he's the only one who could enact it. And the reason why he's the only one who could enact it is not because he's king. It's because he was a warrior. Right. 
I mean, if, far, if a farmer tried to stand up and say, I'm just as important as the warrior, the warrior's just going to go cut his head off. Sure. <laughs> you know, the artisan goes, it, it, you know, how, how dare you treat me like less than a warrior? You need to value me as much as you do the... What are they going to do? They're not going to buy any wares from that person. They're going right. to, you know, they're going to kick them out. The only person who had the authority and the power to make this message something that the nation of Israel could accept was the king, the warrior king, David, who lived this and who was all, you know, he was, he was the very thing that he was coming against and, and bringing down to the level of the rest of society. and. So I think there's a huge lesson in, in, in that. And because he, he's leading by example and he's saying, I'm not debased. I'm not degraded by accepting that these other people are just as important as I am. And if I can be that way as a king, you can be that way as a warrior. Right. And so <laughs> there really is this radical shift within the entire nation. Because David is willing to see himself as just being part of the community and not necessarily over the people as being greater or more, more valuable. Mm -hmm. And he, he recognizes he is a king who is in service to God. And that's why Israel can be a completely different nation than everything else. Because again, he's a king who's totally different from any other king like everybody else had. I mean, he, mm -hmm. he's just, he's unique. So um, David even takes it further. So verse 26, when David came to Ziklag, he sent out part of the spoil to his friends, the elders of Judah, saying, here's a present for you from the spoils of the enemy of the Lord. So, you know, there is a very practical argument that can be made here. David is speaking to people that he's going to need on his side. Uh, these people that he sends gifts to, they're going to be the ones who anoint him king publicly in Second Samuel. We're going to get to that in chapter 2. Uh, the, the evidence of military success would, would validate him as king in their eyes. I mean, he's going to be someone who can fight a successful war against an enemy that Israel had been fighting against since they came out of Egypt. Right. So he, he's doing something very smart. He's also proving that he is the fulfillment of the prophecy that Hannah gave. But verse 27 and through 30, these are a list of the towns that David uh, gave gifts to, and I'm not going to read them, but we're told in verse 31 that it's in Hebron uh, where he had roamed. Now, Hebron is a major area for the, the, the cities of Aaron where the, the Levites would have lived. So right. one argument is that he's sending a tithe um, based on the what he has gained in, in wealth from this raid. Possible. Uh, he, he may have also been repaying those people who had supported him and his men mm -hmm. because it was where they had roamed. That's what we're specifically told, that this is the area where he'd been hiding out from Saul. Right, right. Now that he's killed some enemies, he's got some funds to pay him back. And it was worth your time. It was worth your effort to support me back then. I'm going to prove it because I'm going to need your support in the future. And, mm -hmm. and so from a very practical standpoint, this makes sense. It's the wise thing for the king of, uh, future king of Israel to do. Mm -hmm. However, it also demonstrates that, once again, David's not Saul. Because what did Saul do? David had taken things. He'd taken wealth. He had taken livestock. He'd taken people. He'd taken David himself. Now, David, here, he's getting ready to step into being king. He's not taking. He's giving. Mm -hmm. And he's giving to the people that immediately surround him. And he's giving to the people who've supported him. And you know, these are the elders and friends. So when he's saying elders... This isn't elderly as in they couldn't fight, but it could be that. But it's people who weren't on the battlefield, people who were respected for their wisdom mm -hmm. and their, their guidance in spiritual truth and these sorts of things, people who, who had the ability to think through a problem. And so we're being shown David is, we're being shown what kind of king David is going to be. He's not going to be Saul. Uh, he's not going to be king like other nations, and he's going to be that embodiment of Hannah's prophecies. And he's he's ushering in this new era, not just to the nation of Israel, but but how 
Israel relates to the world and eventually how it's going to impact the world. Right. And, and it's really interesting to me because the we seem to think that equality and people being worthy of wages and being respected no matter what their profession is, it is a pretty new concept. And when you recognize you can look at it being an integral part of Israel's history mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and the way that they approach individuals, right down to don't return a runaway slave, mm -hmm. we begin to see how much this world has really been impacted in a very positive way by this book that's been maligned so right. often. Right. And, and I'm just, it, it blows me away that we accuse this book of being exactly the opposite of what it's accomplished. And I mean, which would you don't, it doesn't make sense when you think about it, because if it was this horrible manual on how to control people and manipulate people, then why is the culture that it's produced one that celebrates equality? Yeah. So. <laughs> no, it's, it's, that's kind of funny. That reminds me of, uh, it's funny, uh, Jordan Peterson, I've listened to quite a bit of his stuff. And every time he, he references Freud, he goes, all anyone ever talks about is Freud's mistakes anymore. Right. Or the things that they see as mistakes. He goes, Freud got a lot of things right, but the problem is we've just kind of integrated the things he got right into just everyday culture, and mm -hmm. we overlook the fact that that's where some of these things came from. Yeah. And then we only want to pick on the mistakes because it's the only thing we don't understand. And so I think that's kind of an interesting thing, not to say that the Bible has mistakes, but to say that the parts of the Bible people don't understand and want to malign, those are the only things the only things that people know because they have taken all the other things and integrated it into society at large. And so the, the only thing that really sticks out to them are things that don't line up with their worldview. Oh, yeah. Uh, oh, yeah. And we don't realize that they don't line up with your worldview because the Bible presented them as a critique mm -hmm. of the way the world was operating at that point in time. And even when it comes down to, okay, which, which nation should you attack? Wh which which people groups do you say are not going to be allowed to stay in Canaan? It, that has been presented over and over again as genocide. Mm -hmm. And the thing is, if you go over and you know flip a few pages over to Genesis, uh, sorry, Deuteronomy twenty, you have laws concerning warfare. And when you read through those, you, you know, when you go out to war against your enemies, see horses and chariots and an army larger than you, you shall not be afraid because God's with you. And it talks about all of this other stuff and it talks about not being, not being afraid and not having panic and who, who's not allowed to go fight. You don't send them one out who's um, recently gotten married, who's mm -hmm. built a new house, all of these things. But verse 10, when you draw near to a city to fight against it, offer terms of peace to it. And if it, respond, if it responds to you peaceably and opens up to you, then the people shall, sorry, the people who are found in it shall do forced labor for you and shall serve you. But if it makes no peace, then you shall make wars against, if it makes war against you, you shall besiege it. So, you know, this, this idea that anyone who's not on that little list of nations like the Amalekites, mm -hmm. you offer peace to them. Right. You, and, oh, they're supposed to serve you? Well, here's the thing. If one of your slaves runs away because you've been too mean, then your neighbor is going to have to keep that slave and let them figure out where they're going to live on your neighbor's property. Mm -hmm. So now you start getting how these little webs work together to create the kind of society where there can be justice and there can be equality. Mm -hmm. But if you only read, well, they've got to serve you. You, you, that you've got to keep them as slaves if you win. Right. And you don't stop to think, wait a minute, they had to offer peace to whoever they're going to attack. Well, what about these other nations? You, 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 you've got to be able to hold all of these pieces in place. Yeah. And, and that's what the rabbis were so good about, it was holding all of these pieces in place and having that person to say, okay, yeah, you're right on this point, but did you factor in this point? Right. And right. which is why conversation becomes such a huge issue whenever we're talking about the Bible. And the, the Amalekites are just a really good example of someone who had treated people really wrong. Yeah, and the fact that, like you said, the, the people who are defenseless, it's... Their continued MO here in the book. You know, we see it in 
in the Exodus, mm -hmm. and then we see it here in Samuel. Exactly, and they don't they they don't stop being horrible people until they are wiped out. And part of that's because that was their heritage that they never stepped away from. And when they and when they did step away from that heritage, and they began acting with kindness and care and consideration, or you know, more like an Israelite, mm -hmm. they they cease to be an Amalekite. They're no longer a member of that nation. Mm -hmm. So uh, we got a few minutes left here. Oh, well, getting pretty close. We're going to be looking at Psalms 25 next time. So, which uh, I spoke about earlier, how yeah. at the beginning of this the siege, uh, this is the first time that we hear reference back to David strengthening himself with the Lord, his God. We've got this this first time that in like three chapters that we now have this appeal to God and the possibility that at this point is when Psalms 25 is being written. And we're going to talk about why it does fit. And again, I think I said in last episode that we're just going to do it mostly because I want to. There is some resistance to this idea that this was the psalm that was written at that point. Okay. But we haven't seen one in a while. David hasn't given us any reason to go look for a psalm in a while. But, you know, David was kind of wrestling through some issues around this time. It seems like it. I, I think so. But I think we're seeing him become who he's supposed to be. And then when he steps into that role and he embraces it, we don't need Saul anymore. Right. You know, he, he's battled it out. So that's going to be after we go through Psalms 25, Saul, uh, Saul's death, and we'll be moving into 2 Samuel and David actually stepping into that role uh, as king over Israel. And so I'm looking forward to getting there because that's going to be a fun, fun time because David doesn't always do the best when he's on the throne either. And yeah. continues to be very, very human during that time. Absolutely. Well, I look forward to seeing that because there's, there's a lot of uh, episodes in David's life that I'm sure we're going to learn a good amount from and some things we're going to get to look at in, in a new kind of light that, again, get the Sunday school glasses off and, and really look <laughs> at the text. So, um, well, yeah, well, let's, uh, I guess we'll go ahead and break there. And the next time when you come back into town, we'll tackle that stuff. I'm and... trying to figure out what Sunday school glasses look like. Mm -hmm. So, <laughs> anyway. They're rose colored. Um, but the, uh, that being said, we should let everyone go. And thank you for <laughs> joining us. Um, if you had a good time and want to join us, uh, Raven ravencreeksc.com. I've done this, yeah, yeah, four times. After, I don't know why. It's like it should get easier to close these out by the end of the, the weekend. Nah. But I feel like I'm getting repetitive. So ravencreeksc.com. Find us there. <laughs> uh, shoot us an email. Listen to our shows. Hit the backlog. Whatever you want to do. Um <laughs> If you want to contact us directly, um, Raven Creek SC on all the social media, that gets you to us. And, Facebook uh, message or email. Facebook, email, Twitter, yeah. So hit us up. We'll be glad to hear from you. We'll see you next time. Bye. Bye. You've been listening to the Faith and Other Oddities podcast, a Raven Creek Social Club production. Don't forget to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. If you like what you've heard, please write us a review on iTunes or consider supporting us on patreon.com slash ravencreeksc. As always, thank you for listening and don't forget to join us next week.